What's up guys, welcome to our channel. This week we're going to be talking about what it means to be bilingual. Francesca and I spent the last three months enrolled in a course at Rutgers University called Bilingualism of the Mind. Throughout this course we learned about the definition of bilingualism and what it means to be bilingual. And we're super excited to talk to you guys about that today because we know it can be a confusing topic. How much of a second language do you need to know to be classified as bilingual? And what is going on in your head when you are bilingual that might be different from your monolingual peers? But before we continue, we want to let you know that you can find all of the articles and studies that we referenced today in this podcast in the description. Okay, let's get started. In academia, there's actually two main schools of thought on bilingualism. The first one we're going to talk about is called the fractional or monolingual view, which states that the bilingual is two monolinguals in one person. Francesca, what are the problems with this perspective? I'm glad you asked. The problem with this view is that it negates the bilingual identity of anyone who isn't completely fluent in both languages. Because the reality is that the majority of bilingual people do not fit this fully fluent, perfect idea that people think of when they think about what a bilingual person sounds like. Personally, I think another issue with this view is that it tests bilingual people according to monolingual standards. So these tests don't really take into account the bilingual's differential needs for each language and the different social functions that each language plays in that person's life. Yeah, they may use one language at home and one in school, so their vocabulary size, which means the number of words that they know in each language and the type of words that they know, are going to be different. One may be more casual for family and friends and the other more formal for school and the workplace. I'd say this thinking is also problematic because it excludes any consideration of the interaction between the two languages. The two languages are viewed as autonomous systems, with the only contact occurring as a result of language interference. Basically, mistakes made as a result of code switching or borrowing and ignoring the possibility of simultaneous activation intended by the speaker. Along those lines, there's also an issue that arises in the research done on bilinguals. We have this problem where we look at how each language is activated one at a time, ignoring the reality of any simultaneous activation. And this isn't to mention that all the consequences affect the speaker too. The fractional view of bilinguals makes them evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. They unfairly criticize their abilities in each language according to monolingual standards. So the question is, is there a better way to evaluate bilinguals? Yes! The holistic or bilingual view of bilingualism states that there is a coexistence of two languages in the bilingual, which produces a unique and specific speaker and hearer, and rejects the idea that the bilingual is basically the equivalent to two monolinguals shoved into one person. The holistic view is great because it understands that the bilingual is not the sum of two monolingual parts. It takes into account the constant interaction of the two languages and recognizes that this interaction and coexistence produces a different but complete linguistic identity for that individual. This holistic view also understands that because the needs and uses of the two languages are different, the bilingual rarely fits that perfect ideal bilingual we mentioned earlier that is completely fluent in both languages. Because of this, it's also understood that the bilingual cannot be evaluated by monolingual standards, but rather studied and evaluated through their total language repertoire. There's also this other hypothesis that sort of branches off of the holistic view, which states that the bilingual shifts in their abilities in each language depending on the needs of the environment that they're in. This secondary hypothesis looks at bilingualism on a continuum. One end is a totally monolingual speech mode, where they're restricted to just one language, and the other is a bilingual speech mode, where they're with other bilinguals who share the same two languages that they know. This allows bilinguals to evolve and change, moving between the two ends of the spectrum depending on the context they're in. So bilingualism is the knowledge of two or more languages. This complex psychological scenario produces a unique linguistic identity. In other words, a bilingual person is not like two monolinguals because two or more languages interact constantly, modifying each other.
Now that we've established what bilingualism is, let's talk about who qualifies as being bilingual. I don't know if our listeners know this, but more than 50% of the world is bilingual. And these people are not what you or I would consider completely fluent in both languages for the reasons we just stated. There are many different levels of expertise when it comes to learning a language, and all of them are valid. We can break up bilinguals into the following categories. Beginner, intermediate and advanced L2 learners, simultaneous bilinguals, heritage speakers, and multilinguals. So let's break that down a bit. Beginner L2 learners are those just starting to learn the language, taking intro level classes. Intermediate L2 learners are usually the people who have completed a major or minor in that language, and advanced L2 learners in general are graduate level students of that language who have achieved a near native speaker status, basically just saying that they're very advanced. Simultaneous bilinguals acquire both languages at the same time, but in a cultural context with no asymmetry. Mary, do you mind give us, giving us an example of that? Yeah, so that's like someone who grows up learning Spanish and English in Miami or Catalan and Spanish in Barcelona. Heritage speakers are a subcategory of simultaneous bilinguals, where there is one social language and one minority language. So you speak one at home and one when you're out and about. And finally, multilinguals are people who speak three or more languages. Something interesting about bilingualism, Francesca, is that it literally reforms your mind. Are you referring to the development of code switching? I know we talked about this a little bit earlier when we discussed how bilinguals are viewed in academia. Yes, we did. For those who don't know, code switching is known as the ability for a bilingual person to use words and phrases from one language and interpose them with another language. For example, saying something like, yo vide mi purse en la sala. So your mind blends the two languages together? Well, not quite. As a bilingual person, it's hypothesized that your mind creates separate vocabulary banks for word selection based on language. However, sometimes the mind can select from the inactive vocabulary bank, either as an attempt to communicate a concept more specifically or as a subconscious relaxation of the mechanism responsible for choosing words. And what about borrowing? Borrowing is more similar to the concept of blending that you mentioned earlier. It means taking a phrase or a word from one language and adopting it into the other language, but pronouncing it and even possibly conjugating it as if it belonged to the second language. Like saying humoroso to mean humorous in Spanish, even though its original meaning in Spanish is closer to capricious. Exactly, Francesca. Bilingualism is awesome because it exercises your mind, making it stronger. What other changes are there? For bilinguals, it's possible to exist in different linguistic modes as we discussed earlier. They can act as monolinguals in monolingual environments and mostly but never completely deactivate the use of their unneeded language. Or they can act as bilinguals when it's sensed that they're existing in a bilingual environment and both languages remain active. Which is why they should be evaluated differently than monolinguals as we suggested earlier. Exactly. Being bilingual is a complicated experience. For some people, it can feel like being caught between two totally different worlds. It can be a difficult process to navigate the changes that becoming bilingual or growing up in a bilingual environment can have on your life, especially in comparison to the monolingual experience. But I still think that the challenge is definitely worth it. There are a lot of advantages to being bilingual. Social, professional, economic, and cognitive benefits all occur as a result of developing a second language. As one might guess, being bilingual opens up a whole new world of social possibilities. You're able to converse with people and gain perspectives you would have never had the opportunity to before. Research has recently been conducted, actually, based on the hypothesis that due to the perspectiveness and attention required to learn a second language, some of those social skills would be transferred similarly to social encounters. 
<clears throat> that research has revealed that bilingual people may be better at perceiving and responding to different types of social information. It's been suggested, Francesca, that bilinguals are better able to adapt to new environments, cope with change, and attend to others' perspectives. So when you meet a new group of people, change your entire plans for the evening on a whim, or need to know why your friend might not understand a conversational point, bilinguals have the increased ability to succeed in these social situations. But the benefits of bilingualism aren't just limited to social situations. There's also professional and economic benefits. Recent studies have indicated that although previous assumptions have led people to believe that bilingualism has more benefits in the labor market, Gondara says that this skill set may not be as profitable as previously thought. More recent studies, such as Chiswick and Miller published in 2002, have shown that there are less salary-related benefits to bilingualism, but more benefits in hiring. Bilingualism is a skill that is in high demand in professional fields like medical sciences, education, and government work. Therefore, the result could be better for job security for bilingual individuals because they are in higher demand. <laughs> Good one, Francesca. Additionally, it's been demonstrated that bilingual children develop the ability to solve problems that contain conflicting or misleading cues at an earlier age than monolinguals. This early mastery of conflict resolution is a great asset for professionalism. Sounds like there are a lot of professional benefits to being bilingual. I'd say so. Linguistic advantages to being bilingual include a reformation of the mind's linguistic processing abilities. Bilingualism results in the ability to acquire more languages more easily in comparison to monolingual peers. When it comes to cognitive benefits, there's some debate on the subject. The bilingual advantage hypothesis suggests that bilingualism contributes to advanced executive function. This results in better inhibitory control and better working memory. If you want more information on the bilingual advantage hypothesis, check out the next video in this series. The bilingual experience exists differently for individuals due to factors like age of acquisition, duration of active bilingualism, intensity of use, and proficiency in each language, to name a few. Studies have demonstrated that possible cognitive benefits of bilingualism, aside from heightened executive function, might be a delay in the onset of Alzheimer's disease in aging individuals by four years. If I was an already bilingual, I'd be tempted to download Duolingo right now. 80-year-old Francesca thanks you. When it comes to being bilingual, every experience is unique. Bilingualism exists on a spectrum encompassing even the earliest of learners to those who are so advanced they could possibly be mistaken for native. Bilingualism changes your mind to curve out a path completely different from monolingualism. You'll see the world differently and be exposed to new experiences, socially, linguistically, professionally, and cognitively. We might be biased when it comes to advocating for the acquiescence of another language, but becoming bilingual can really change your life. So if you ever wanted to learn a new language, just know it's never too late. If you're interested, you can keep watching the videos on this channel for more information on bilingualism. Thanks for listening. <laughs>